Hello and welcome back to another episode of It Happened Here. Before I get into the meat of the case ahead of us, I'm going to kick off with my favourite thing these days, and that is thanking the new patrons of the show. That's the people who have taken themselves off to patreon.com and pledged a little bit of their own hard-earned cash to help me make this show happen. This shout-out goes to Clarissa Ferreira, Roxanne Martin, Michelle Edwards, Janine Gerby, and Pete Kuhn. Thank you so much for your support. You can't even imagine what it means to me to have people say in these quite certain terms that they like and back the show that I'm putting out into the world, in between deadlines and dreams of sleep. But that's the only admin for today, so now, on with the show. It's the 2nd of March, 2011, and on the side of the road in Kailicha, one of Cape Town's sprawling townships, a middle-aged couple kneels in the sand, openly weeping. In front of them is a wooden board hammered into the sand, with a photograph of a stunning young woman attached. There are flowers around the makeshift shrine, and two small bamboo torches are lit beside the board. In the background, a Hindu priest says a solemn prayer. A few metres from the grieving couple, reporters jostle one another to try and get a better shot. The fact that these two are here, all the way from Sweden, is big news. It's part of an ongoing story that has captured international headlines over the past few months. The couple, Nilam and Vinod Hindocha, have come here to grieve their beloved daughter, Annie Devani. This is episode 17, Hijack or Hit, The Murder of Annie Devani. Annie Nina Hindocha was born in Sweden in 1982. She was ethnically Indian and her parents Nilam and Vinod had left Uganda in the 1970s when President Idi Amin had ordered the forced expulsion of the country's Asian minority. Incidentally, Idi Amin is a particular monster whose crimes I might cover one day if I'm feeling ambitious and particularly strong. The Hindotchas were granted residency in Sweden, where they had Annie. She also had two siblings, a sister called Amy and a brother, Anish. Her sister describes her as someone who was extremely family-oriented, a favourite and beloved aunt to her children. Annie was working as a product designer in Sweden when she met Shreyan Devani through mutual friends in London in 2009, and they had dated long distance for a while, until Annie moved to the UK. They got engaged in 2010. Shreyan was from a wealthy family and had made a bit of a name for himself as a consultant before joining his father's business that ran a chain of care homes in the UK. It looked from the outside like a magical and quite romantic relationship, with Shreyan often taking Annie away on international trips, including celebrating their engagement in Paris. They were married in October 2010 in India and had planned to have a second civil ceremony in the UK in 2011 for the friends who couldn't have joined them in India. But first, the pair were going to South Africa for their honeymoon. On November 12, 2010, they had just arrived at Cape Town International Airport after four days in the Kruger National Park. Outside the airport, Shreyan Devani is trying to flag down a taxi to take him and his beautiful new wife to their hotel. He catches the attention of a driver, and they're soon on their way. Outside the car, kilometres of sprawling township flash past, in stark contrast to the luxurious Cape Grace Hotel where they will be staying. The driver, Zola Tonga, tells the newlyweds about South Africa's townships, and some of the tourist attractions they're in, including a local tavern that tourists can visit to get a taste of township life. Zola is moonlighting from his daytime gig as a driver for a tourist operation, and that is perhaps why he's now trying to drum up some extra business from the Devanis while they're here. 
If that's his plan, it seems to have worked, as Shrian pulls Zola aside for a chat shortly after they reach the hotel. According to Zola's later testimony, however, it is at this point that Shrian tells him that he is looking to have a client, quote, removed from the scene. Zola tells the court that Shrian asked him to arrange this and promises 15,000 rand for the hit, which needed to happen as soon as possible, the very next night, in fact, and it needed to look like an accident, a hijacking that got out of hand. For international listeners, hijacking, the crime of forcefully taking someone's vehicle, is relatively common but much feared in South Africa. In response to rising crime rates over the years, people began to arm their homes with, you know, barbed wire and electric wire and intruder alarms. So it became, in some ways, easier to access people and rob them of valuables while they were out and about. And a car is a high-worth object after all. Hijacking is considered aggravated robbery under South African law and has actually been on the rise again recently. In 2010, when our story unfolds, there were over 10,000 carjackings reported to police and that excludes the hijacking of trucks. For interest's sake, the company Tracker South Africa recently reported they were seeing more hijacking than traditional car theft in 2021 something that they call an opportunistic tactic. But I suspect that those figures include trucks because they make mention of vehicles loaded with goods. Whatever the statistics, there's something so visceral about the fear and violence that we associate with hijacking. It's just such a chaotic and fast attack. Add to this the apparent randomness of this type of crime, as well as the high degree of violence associated with it, and you get a category of crime that many people live in true fear of. This is what Zola, and allegedly Shrien, were discussing so casually that day outside the Devani's lavish hotel. Zola apparently knows some people, or maybe he's just enthralled by the promise of that much money, a fortune to most poor South Africans. He agrees to the plan and confirms he'll pick Shrien up the next evening. Zola will later claim that he had no idea, no inkling, that the person Trian wanted murdered was his own wife. The same friendly, beautiful and engaging woman he'd been shuttling around that day. Nonetheless, he agreed to pick up the Devanis for dinner the next evening, and to see what he could do about coming up with some hitmen in the meantime. If this is all starting to sound a tiny bit far-fetched, like a badly plotted crime novel whose author is not afraid to take some leaps. Well, strap in. It's going to get a whole lot weirder and even less believable. The testimony given by the handful of people involved in this conspiracy is all over the place. They contradict one another at every turn and none of them seem to be able to even keep their own stories straight. On November 13th, the day after the Devanis arrived, Zola pulls up to the hotel around 7.30 at night, the time he had agreed to return to pick the couple up for dinner and a night on the town. Since his first whispered conference with Shrien, Zola has apparently been a busy man. He's managed to get in contact with an acquaintance of his who works at another hotel, a man named Mondi Mbolombo. As part of his later testimony, Zola says he approached Mondi because he lives in the location or township and, quote, knows everything that happens there. Zola says, and I'm quoting again, I realize that there must be things that he is aware of, things that are happening in the location, things that I am not aware of, end quote. Now that seems like an odd conclusion. To go from here is this guy who knows what happens in his area to this person must be able to find a hitman at the drop of a hat. But whatever the case, Mondi apparently comes through, and he puts Zola in contact with a man called Mzi Wamadoda Gwaba. From there, Zola fleshes out the plan with Mzi Wamadoda and a third man, Kolile Mgeni. These are the people he ropes into his plan, to hijack and murder an apparently unspecified contact of Shrien's. Bizarrely, though, in later testimony, Zola can't seem to decide whether he ever actually met these men before the hijacking took place. In one statement, he seems to say that he was not introduced to the 
two hijackers in person before the crime occurred. In another, he says he met them during the day on the 13th to discuss the plan. He also states that he met Trien again during the day, before picking the Tavanis up that evening, to confirm the arrangement. Conflicting testimony aside, what we do know is that Zola picked up the Devanis at their hotel in the evening and started to drive them to their dinner reservation at an upscale restaurant quite a way out of the city. Apparently, at some point during the drive, the couple decides that they aren't really in the mood for a heavy dinner, and Zola tells them he knows a place in Strand, a seaside town just beyond the city limits. Instead of the elegant winery they'd booked, the Devanis end up at the much more down-to-earth Surfside restaurant, According to one description of events, they have a dinner of curry and sushi, and then they go on a stroll along the beach, a more laid-back evening than what they had originally planned. At around 10.15pm, they jump into Zola's taxi and head back to Cape Town's waterfront for a nightcap. Now, the waterfront where their hotel is located is definitely on the well-heeled tourist end of the spectrum. Like many of the attractions visitors are likely to see in Cape Town, it is also specifically geared for tourists. I mean, we can accuse pretty much the entire city of that, but this particular area certainly more so. It's not a reflection of how most South Africans live, a world away from the informal settlements despite being just a short drive apart. According to Shrien, it was Annie who expressed the desire to see something more authentic something decidedly different from her home country of Sweden. Also, according to Shrien, it was Zola Tonga who suggested that they go see a bit more of the, quote, real Africa. Wherever the suggestion came from, the result was that the young couple shortly found themselves driving down the streets of Guguletu, one of Cape Town's most famous and infamous townships. Now, I don't want to put stereotypes out there about how dangerous it is for a couple of tourists to be wandering around an area like this at night, but for sure, most locals, including many of the ones who live in Googs, would probably tell a couple of affluent tourists to take care. Like any area or city, South Africa's townships are varied places. Some bits are quite established, others more ramshackle, but almost universally, they have been neglected spaces where roads are poorly maintained, the streetlights intermittent, and electricity patchy. Let's remember that South Africa is one of the most unequal societies on earth, and the areas already blighted by poverty are often deeply affected by opportunistic crime. There are so many contributing factors I could go into here, including the dehumanizing effect of profound and multi-generational poverty. But to spare us the dissertation, I want to say one broad thing. It is an unfortunate truth that South Africa's townships see a lot of violence and crime, most of which is experienced by the residents of these places. Tourists are typically warned to avoid them, unless they're traveling with a knowledgeable tour guide, or someone they trust who lives in the area, or, I suppose, if they are particularly street smart. I say that acknowledging that it is an insufficient summary that doesn't do justice to the vibrant and varied cultures of these places, or the vast majority of law-abiding people who live there. At around 10.45pm, Zola stops at an intersection in Guguletu, and suddenly all hell breaks loose. In what must have been a deeply surreal moment, the couple look up to see a man hammering on the car window with a gun, demanding Zola unlock the car doors. Within seconds, the hijackers have entered the vehicle, and according to one account, they take up position in the front passenger and driver's seat. According to another account, they force Zola into the passenger seat, while one gunman takes the wheel and the other squeezes into the back seat with the terrified newlyweds. The two attackers Olile and MZ1 Madonna speed off in the vehicle, stopping briefly to throw Zola out at a nearby petrol station after relieving him of his phone. This is all part of the plan, as he later recounts. The hijackers then drive with the Devani still trapped in the car for a full 45 minutes. Eventually, close to midnight, they stop the car and order Shrien out, in the middle of another of Cape Town's townships, Kailicha. There's a couple of versions of this story too. 
In one, Shrien argues and is forcibly removed through the car window. In another, he's thrown out while the vehicle is still moving. Whichever it is, Annie is left behind in the car and it speeds off into the night, before coming to a stop at a street in part of Kailicha called Elita Park. There, with the car pulled up on the side of the road next to a field, Annie Devani is shot at point-blank range, a single bullet to the neck. The only merciful aspect is that according to the autopsy report, the bullet severed two veins, and Annie would have bled out in seconds. That's small comfort to her father, the man I mentioned at the start of this episode, grieving his loss at this very spot. In an earlier trip to the country, Vinod traced the route the hijackers took, escorted by police so that he could see for himself where his daughter had spent her last moments. Between the point where Shrien was thrown from the car and the point where Annie was shot, he counted three minutes. That would have been the amount of time his daughter was alone with the hijackers before she died. Meanwhile, at the site where he was thrown from the car, Shrien is desperately banging on the doors of nearby shacks, Eventually, someone opens for him, and he manages to contact the police and report what has happened. They escort him back to the Cape Grace Hotel. By all accounts, he is completely shell-shocked at this stage. The cops immediately begin combing through Guguletu and Kailicha, looking for any traces of the car or Annie. They get a break the next morning, when a resident of Elita Park phones in to report a car matching the taxi's description on the side of the road outside her house. When the police reach the vehicle and open it, they find Annie's body in the back seat. They dutifully catalogue the scene, and in doing so, the forensic team recovers a key piece of evidence that will lead to their first arrest. That evidence is a bloody fingerprint belonging to someone who's already been on the wrong side of the law, Kolile Mgeni. Kolile's arrest happens swiftly, once the fingerprint's been identified, he apparently confesses almost immediately. It would have been hard not to, perhaps, given that he is in possession of items taken from the Devanis during the hijacking. In his confession, he implicates Mzi Wamadoda, and he too is arrested in short order. By the 17th of November, Kolile has been charged with murder, kidnapping, and robbery with aggravating circumstances. By the 22nd, Zola and Mzi Wamadoda have also been charged for these crimes. Meanwhile, Shrien is back in London at this point, already talking to the press and giving them somewhat inconsistent versions of the events that transpired that night. Though perhaps the inconsistency is not surprising for someone who's just suffered such a major life trauma. It's a couple of weeks later, on the 7th of December, that the wheels really come off. That's the day that Zola Tonga appears in court and the prosecution drops the bombshell of his signed confession. In that confession, he alleges Shrien masterminded the entire thing and that he told Zola to make it look like a hijacking gone wrong. Shrien's arrest in the UK comes amidst a storm of media coverage. He is being charged with conspiracy to murder and the South African authorities quickly launch extradition proceedings against him. At the same time, no one could possibly know that it's going to be four long years before Shrien ever sets foot in a South African courtroom. Initially, the extradition proceedings are put on hold, because in the words of Shrien's lawyer, his client is suffering from, quote, an acute stress disorder which would be an understandable reaction, I suppose, to being accused of murdering one's wife and to surviving a hijacking on your honeymoon. A month later, there is talk of a suicide attempt when Shrien overdoses on a cocktail of drugs, including the diazepam that he's been using to get to sleep. I say talk of an attempt because Shrien's own psychiatrist denies that this was the intent. The media and the media's audiences in both countries were transfixed by this case. It obviously has a deeply personal and sad narrative, but the coverage of the case was also tinged with, well, let's call them agendas. For South Africa, at least, the UK is an important tourism market, 
and so there's a lot of comment from officials quite keen to put the blame on the husband, a tourist himself, rather than face the fallout of this horrible crime. In the UK press coverage, some stories lean hard into stereotypes. It's not that we don't have an alarming crime rate in South Africa, and I don't have 20 hours to do a blow-by-blow media analysis here, but some of the reporting digs into the tired tropes of deep dark Africa, tropes that we still see in international coverage of local crime. In defense of my fellow journalists, though, we also start to learn more about the troubles below the surface. Through the media, we learn that Annie had called off the relationship at least once and had serious misgivings before her wedding. This was a taste of what was to come when Shrien finally gets his day in court. In the months that follow the hijacking and the accusation of his involvement in a plot to murder, Shrien is kept in psychiatric care until finally, in August 2011, a judge rules that he can be extradited to South Africa to stand trial. But what follows is a legal battle with enough back and forth to give you whiplash, as over the next three years, Shrien's extradition order is repeatedly appealed and affirmed. Meanwhile, back in South Africa in 2012, Mziwa Madoda and Kolile have already been charged and tried, having pled guilty, earning themselves 25 years and life in prison, respectively. Mzi insists in his testimony that Kolile was the gunman. Kolile says the exact opposite thing, and neither of them is able to directly implicate Shrien in the plot. Only Zola, the taxi driver, can do that linking. Zola proves a willing witness, entering into a plea bargain that reduces his own sentence to 18 years, in exchange for spilling the beans on everything he knows about the plot to kill Annie. Sadly, when Shrien eventually does get extradited to South Africa, Zola's testimony will turn out to be basically worthless. So it's April 2014 when Shrien finally sets foot on South African soil again. The trial is slated to start in October, and Shrien waits out the intervening months in a secure mental facility in Cape Town. During this trial, we learn more about the cracks in the couple's relationship, something that is beginning to look a lot like motive. The court hears that Annie was unhappy, which I've alluded to, including testimony that she felt she didn't get along well enough with her husband-to-be, and that she had considered calling the whole thing off more than once. And we hear testimony that Shrien, too, really wasn't thrilled about the fact that he was getting married, and that he was looking for a way out. This includes the accusation that Shrien was secretly bisexual or gay, and had been living a double life, hiding his sexuality from Annie and his family. I'm not mad about including this detail, not least of all because it is essentially a contested allegation with no clarity or finality to be had. I also don't think killing your wife is a typical solution to that particular problem. So I'm not going to weigh in on the question of Shreyan's sexuality, how can I know? But I will say that I do believe that some people will kill to protect their reputations or their way of life, and any long-term deception on their part would add to that desperation. We would learn through testimony that Trien believed, rightly or wrongly, that calling off the marriage would have meant being disowned by his wealthy and influential family. If he did, in fact, believe that, and we don't know for sure, then that for me is more akin to a motive, or at least a reason that a theoretical someone with a questionable grasp on empathy and insufficient respect for human life might look to find a more radical solution. For the record, this last part was general speculation, because for my own reasons, I'm interested in long cons and double lives. This particular psychology, the violent attempt to preserve a lie or con, is explored in depth in a podcast called Red Collar, so check that out if this is also of interest to you. But back to the actual case in front of us. Whether Shrien was secretly gay or not, whether he wanted out of the marriage or not, 
the question the court still has to answer is, was this enough to drive this man to arrange the murder of his wife in cold blood on their honeymoon? And if it was, is it really plausible that he managed to do all of that within just a day and a half of getting off the plane in Cape Town? I'm not the one who needed to be convinced one way or another. That falls to a judge. In early December 2014, just two short months after it started, Shireen Devani's trial was over. The judge, in response to Devani's lawyers asking that the case be dismissed, has agreed. In her judgment, Western Cape High Court Judge Jeanette Traverso states, and this is a long quote, but bear with me, to summarize, Mr. Tonga, that's Zola to you and me, who was the only witness who had linked the accused to this conspiracy, gave evidence to this court which is so improbable and contains so many mistakes, lies and inconsistencies that one simply cannot know where the lies end and the truth begins. She continues, I accept that at this stage of the proceedings, the credibility of a witness plays a limited role, but in my view, the evidence of these witnesses is so replete with fundamental contradictions on the key components of the state's case that I can all but ignore it. In making this finding, I take into account that all three witnesses, Mr. Tongo, Mr. Mblombo, and Mr. Kwabe, are intelligent people, and therefore more than capable of attempting to twist their version to implicate the accused. End quote. You heard that right. Zola, the prosecution's star witness, gave testimony so bizarre and all over the place that the judge basically had to throw it out. And just like that, after four bitter years of battling mental health crises and extradition, Shreyan Devani was a free man. For Annie's family, the judgment came as a bitter disappointment. After all this time, they'd hoped at least to have some closure, some sort of answer to the why of what happened to their beloved Annie on that awful night in Cape Town. So that is the story of the murder of Annie Devani, and I'd love to know what you think. Was an innocent, grieving husband the victim of a state's desire to deflect blame, or did the mastermind of Annie's death go free? Thanks for listening. This episode was researched and written by Samantha Render and me, Kate Thompson-Davey. It Happened Here is a Ready Freddy production.